Allora, benvenuti. Welcome. All those who are linked up to what is the third uh, meeting of this uh, cycle of public uh, dialogues promoted by the Parliament. And the theme of this cycle is Ideas for a New World. There's a specific theme to this uh, conference uh, in Internet Access, a new human right. Uh, we're talking about the Internet becoming a, a democratic right, if you like. May I welcome Professor Romano Prodi uh, from Italy. Thank you for accepting the invitation. We await uh, linking up with the uh, President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. She's uh, still at the uh, Commissioner's College meeting, but she will be with us very shortly. I will give the floor to the President of the Parliament to say a few words of welcome, and then we will start off with the discussion. A number of guests have provided recorded uh, speeches. Well, thank you, says uh, uh, President Sassoli. I want to thank Mr. Prodi. Thank you also to the Commission President, uh, not yet here, of course, but uh, she will join us very soon. And it's very important that we have these fora for debate so that our institutions can open wide the windows and doors to allow in new ideas. Uh, we all need, and we are realizing this more and more, we all need courage to tackle this pandemic and to tackle uh, what will be the legacy of the pandemic. And as uh, has been said in other places, uh, we are now all coming to see that uh, instruments or tools such as the web, if we didn't have them, had we not had them, well, all our performances would have suffered, and even uh, democracy, the democracy of institutions would have suffered, because uh, the parliament and, and the uh, national parliaments also have been able to continue to work thanks to the web. And digitalization in the time of the pandemic, um, uh, well, it helps us to be aware that we need to make this digitalization available to everyone uh, and to make sure that uh, thanks to what's going on now more and more citizens can really take part actively in the world and can t take c can be protagonists can be active can continue to work uh, thanks to new tools. And over the past few months, we've seen the importance of digitalization in schools, in education, primary, secondary, and universities. Uh, also, links between um, research centers. Now, web tools uh, are becoming part of what I might call the, the baggage we, we consider to be a human right, personal baggage. And uh, the UN has been doing a lot of work uh, on this subject recently. Um, it needs to become an instrument to uh, achieve policies uh, which will uh, enable all of us to uh, be able to use the internet more easily and the EU is just as important clearly in this regard. So making the internet and access to internet a human right. And at the uh, European Council I was able to make a point on this too. Uh, we are currently doing a lot of thinking around this uh, subject. Uh, we need ideas, we need intelligence, and ideas to uh, improve the situation. Now, it's uh, I'm delighted that we have Mr. Brody, who has done a lot of thinking on this. I'm delighted we have the Commission uh, President also. We have about an hour to uh, hold this discussion, and uh, I look forward very much to it. So thank you all, and thank you, Chairman. We have two recorded contributions 
to this debate. The first one is from Sir, Sir Tim, Sir Tim um, Berners-Lee. He is considered to be the inventor of the World Wide Web. He was and nom he was nominated and named a knight by uh, Queen Elizabeth, and of course one of his colleagues won the Nobel Prize. And he is a great promoter of uh, human human rights in general. So can we have the speech, please, now from Tim Berners-Lee? Holy President van der Leyen, Professor Prodi, distinguished guests. It's an honor for me to introduce a dialogue that is so important to me. Thank you for the invitation to do it. On March 12th this year, we mark the 31st birthday of the World Wide Web. But as we reflected on all that the web has become over more than three decades, we could not ignore that we were in, on the brink of a crisis. The day before that anniversary of March, Italy closed shops and venues across the country. Austria closed all its schools. Ireland and Sweden recorded their first deaths from coronavirus. The world, the United Nations reported that 20% of the world's students were already out of classroom. And the World Health Organization officially declared the, the outbreak of pandemic all in that one day. The seven months since have seen serious hardship here in Europe and around the world. The cost of the pandemic has been unprecedented. And yet, as bad as it has been, imagine a crisis like this, but without the web. With having access to the web, employees can work from home and keep economies afloat. Governments and others can, are able to disseminate vital health information. Families can keep in touch. Students, if they're lucky, are able to keep their education intact and their dreams alive by learning online. In this crisis, for those who have it, the web is not a luxury, it's a lifeline. 31 years ago, I was a software engineer at CERN in Geneva. It was there that I wrote a memo outlining the idea for what later became the World Wide Web. My boss, Mike Sendel, agreed to allow me to work on it as, as a sort of skunk works project between serious physics projects. His original copy of the memo was found 10 years later with a handwritten comment in the margin which reads, vague but exciting. I've always been grateful that he didn't think exciting but vague, or we may not all be where we are today. In the years that followed, it became clear to me that the web should not be owned by any single individual corporation or government. It had to belong to everyone. In fact, it was an expression of a set of values that are familiar to many people in this virtual room today and to citizens across Europe. Enshrined in the Charter for Fundamental Rights are the rights to free expression and association, human dignity, the protection of personal data, non-discrimination and gender equality, the right to education and the freedom to work, the freedom to conduct a business. Those very same values, universal human rights, are woven into the web. It was created with technology, but it was created for humanity. That's why I agree with President Sassoli when he says that our discussions about the digital world must be anchored not only in technical issues, but in human rights and justice. The internet is not just a technology. It is knowledge. It is opportunity. It is empowerment. It is critical to life in today's world. So today I want you to urge you, I want to urge you to recognize internet access as a human right to work with me, the World Wide Web Foundation I co-founded, and citizens across Europe to ensure that the internet is safe and empowering for everyone. And, not, uh, and to come together in support of the contract for the web, the first global plan of action for the web we want. 
I am a technologist who cares deeply about the social implications of the technology that I and others have created. You are policymakers who care deeply about the role of technology in your constituents' lives. The contract for the web is designed to create a community of people like us with diverse perspectives and expertise to work together to build the web we want. A few moments ago, I asked you to imagine living through this pandemic without the web. In fact, that is the reality for almost half the world. 3.5 billion people still don't have internet access. Based on current trends, it will be later than 2050 by the time they do, far short of the original UN Sustainable Development Goal to achieve universal connectivity. Also, as it is today, men are 21% more likely to be online than women. And this rises to 52% more likely in the world's least developed countries. This is not just a power pro problem far from home. Here in Europe, 43% of citizens ha don't have the digital skills necessary to search for information on the web, send emails, make video calls, shop, or pay their bills online. In Spain, 19% of citizens don't own a computer. Every year since I invented the web, its importance in people's lives has grown. At the same time, the disenfranchisement of those who can't connect has grown too. Web access is now a prerequisite for many of the sustainable development goals, from supporting education and reducing inequalities, driving economic growth, and boosting health outcomes. As the COVID-19 crisis deepens the inequalities between those who are connected and those who are not, we must accelerate the building of a world where everyone, especially women and girls, can access the internet. To do that, we must recognize internet access is a new human right and work to close the digital divide as an international priority. And access to the web is just the beginning. Our online world must be safe and empowering for everyone, but is currently falling short on that promise. The web's benefits come with many risks to our privacy, our democracy, our health, and our security. I'm particularly concerned about online harms facing women and girls, especially those who disproportionately experience intersectional discrimination due to their race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or other identities. As the web reshapes our world, we have a responsibility to make sure it works for all of humanity, not just the privileged few. So how do we achieve our ambitions for a digital world that is truly safe and empowering for everyone? The good news is we don't have to start from scratch. Action to ensure human rights are protected online can build on the rights we've established offline. Europe's Charter for Fundamental Rights and other human rights frameworks give us the bedrock that we need. The United Nations has engaged in this work through its roadmap for digital cooperation. If a safe and empowering web for everyone is our destination, implementing this roadmap will help get us there. As a vehicle to carry, out, carry us on that journey, we have the contract for the web. For the Web Foundation and our partners, the work on the contract for the web started with nine high-level principles that ensure human rights are respected and protected online. For example, governments must ensure everyone can connect to the internet, while companies must respect people's individual privacy and build online trust. On top of these principles, we build a number of specific clauses for governments and for companies and for all of us as digital citizens. I'm proud that so far, more than 1,300 companies and civil society organizations have signed a contract for the web from Microsoft to Reporters Without Borders. 
I'm also proud that governments here in Europe have stepped forward. The French government, led by the digital minister who shared the stage with me, stage with me when we launched the contract. The German government, who served on the contract core group, and the Italian and Spanish governments who provided key support. But now I ask you to go further. The contract for the web is about to enter a new phase as we move from words to action. And the nations, institutions, and citizens of Europe have a huge role to play. The World Wide Web was born in Europe, and the European Union has played a leading role in setting evidence-based standards, promoting a web available to everyone that ensures human rights. To continue playing a leading role, I urge EU policymakers to be ambitious, inclusive, and collaborative in setting the tech policy agenda for the decades to come. To be ambitious means getting behind the UN goal to deliver universal internet access. It is an ambitious target, but not an impossible one. We have the technology to do it, but we need the com political commitment, the collaboration, and the funding for internet infrastructure, device affordability, and uh, digital skills training. The Alliance of the Affordable Internet, an initiative by Foundation, has calculated at around 430 billion US dollars of additional investment is needed over 10 years to hit this target. This is a number that is realistically within our means. The world spends the same amount on carbonated soft drinks every year. Connecting the world will also have incredible social and economic returns on that investment. To be inclusive in setting the agenda means to truly make the web a web for everyone, as I first intended. Co policymakers must protect individuals against in discrimination online, particularly those who experience multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. They must also develop laws for targeting the crisis of online gender bias, violence and abuse. For example, the Digital Services Act presents an important opportunity to address the crisis as part of a, a comprehensive framework that prevents and combats violence against women and girls. Finally, being collaborative means recognizing that the challenges facing the web are challenges we can only all solve together. As a multi-stakeholder group, each playing our role, that is government setting up public policy, companies building tools that promote the best in humanity and challenge the worst, and citizens pressing governments and companies to do the right thing, and themselves contributing constructively and discerningly online. All of this collaboration needs to be based on the foundations of evidence. I urge you to work alongside academics, civil society, and technologists to ensure tech policy is rooted in evidence and in a deep understanding of how technology works, as well as how it can evolve in the not-too-distant future. It's clear that we must build a better, safer, and more empowering digital world. We need governments, companies, civil society, and citizens to work together now to create this digital future, a future where internet access is understood and realized as a basic human right. The contract for the web will help us get there though I'm through an ambitious, inclusive, and collaborative approach. As stewards for the contract for the web, the Web Foundation will work with partners to gather best practices, to share this knowledge, to encourage others to follow suit. We'll also work with governments, companies, and civil society to develop an open, inquisitive, and collaborative work approach to regulation throughout through best-in-class technology policies. I ask you to join this fight for the web we want by endorsing the contract for the web and working with us to achieve its vision. We must act and we must act now to connect all of the world 
and fight tirelessly for a better web for everyone. And so, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce this dialogue on internet access as a new human right. Thank you. Ringraziamo. Well, very warm thanks to Sir Tim Berners-Lee for that contribution which he sent us. Uh, this is a very important debate, and that's shown by the fact that we have a former president of the European Commission here, and we have the current president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, who's uh, linked uh, remotely with us. Uh, you're very welcome, uh, and thank you for... Uh, finding the time to join us at this conference. And uh, as you know, Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, mentioned uh, Internet as a human right, and he mentioned the big, the major role for the public, general public, in creating the uh, Internet. And he stressed something, that is the, the guiding role, the vital role of Europe in this process. So I'd like to give you the floor, President von der Leyen. So thank you very much for the invitation to the uh, European Parliament. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Sassoli, uh, dear David. And thank you, President Prodi, for the opportunity to discuss this important topic. So first, let me say it's fantastic that uh, to listen to Sir Berners-Lee and that I can react to Sir Berners-Lee, but it's still a pity we cannot discuss here in person. Um, it was fascinating to listen. Professor Berners-Lee is an inspiration to many of us. He stands, and we could hear that, for an internet that serves humanity, a world wide web that remains open and free. And I think many of us remember when he tweeted, this is for everyone. And this was during the opening of the Summer Olympics in London, uh, 2012 all spelled out across the huge stadium. So this said it all. Today, I believe we should speak about connectivity, technology, and rights. In the European Union, we are proud of our social model. We want to preserve it, and we want to extend it online. Access to the internet is an essential digital right but it needs to be complemented by other rights. The right to learn basic digital skills, for example, or the right to have e-government services available, or to enjoy access to information and services despite disabilities. The right to be protected, safe and secure. The right to be online and to have the freedom of speech online and the right to privacy and protection of personal data. All these rights and freedoms are guaranteed in Europe. And this is what we have in mind when we upgrade our rules on digital services. This is what we have in mind when we work on a secure e-identity for Europeans, for example. When we look into how algorithms and artificial intelligence need to be trained and checked in certain cases. And how, to, how we update our educational system. When we talk about digital sovereignty, it is also about our ability to guarantee these rights for all Europeans. So digital sovereignty is not just an economic concept. We are a union of values. And one of the great questions is, how can we preserve and promote our values in a digitized world? We're still at the very beginning of the digital age. Today, an internet connection is as important as access to electricity, water, or healthcare. And I agree with what Professor Berners-Lee said. Indeed, the recent lockdown has shown from citizens to governments, we all rely on connectivity. And therefore, greater connectivity is not a luxury. It is a necessity. And it is a right for everyone in the European Union. 
every citizen should have access to an affordable, fixed data connection. It is a universal service, like receiving post or electricity. I also agree that we cannot ignore when 40 percent of the world's population has no online access. Online means empowering people. It means to know what's happening, to learn and qualify, to overcome inequalities. And as you know, my first official visit as Commission President led me to Addis Abeba. In the last years, for example, the European Union has committed 500 million euros to digital projects in Africa. And now, digital moved even more to the center of what we are doing. So it will be a core priority for our international partnerships. And digital will help us in achieving the sustainable development goals we are all thriving for. I think we all agree here today that no one should be deprived of the internet for economic or social reasons. And this is why we have, since many years already, EU rules, rules for universal service. From the end of this year, all users should have access to adequate broadband communication services. And they should come at an affordable price. However, connectivity is not only a right for users. Increasing internet performance is also key for economic opportunity. And it is a prerequisite for long-lasting recovery. But as we all know, fast broadband is still not available for one out of seven Europeans. Only 44% of the European Union is covered by gigabit connectivity. And this is a severe problem, especially in rural areas. There's also work to do to ensure better availability of mobile data. So when we look at 5G, we need to speed up. Member states have assigned only 28% of the key frequencies so far. And this is one reason why each member state will be required to dedicate at least 20% of the recovery and resilience facility, so next generation EU, to the digital transition, 20%. And therefore, next generation EU is our unique chance now to drive expansion to every village we have in the European Union. We should not miss that chance. A responsible use of digital possibilities also includes the guarantee of a secure digital identity. In fact, we want to invest in a new digital identity that will ensure trust and protect users online. They should not be forced to share their personal data to use online services. That's the trap. So, for example, to log into an online travel site, nobody needs to know whether you're married or if you like cats or dogs. At the same time, a trustworthy digital identity will allow everyone to say as much about themselves as they wish, and no matter whether you're posting a comment or signing a contract. Linked to this, we will help to create personal data spaces. Data spaces where citizens can decide individually which data they share, with whom, and against what compensation. At the heart of this is the need to have control of your own personal data. Our EU protection, data protection rules are an excellent example of how Europe can set standards for the world. With the human being at the center, actually including the right to be forgotten. 
Recently, the Court of Justice reaffirmed that personal data must remain safe also when it travels abroad. We're working hard to make sure there's no trade-off between data flows and data protection. Before I come to an end, allow me some words on governance, as Professor Berners-Lee had mentioned this. This is important. The European Union has always been a strong supporter of the multi-stakeholder model for internet governance, inclusive and bottom-up. This is how internet was built, and it should remain like that. What we do not want is a top-down model, because this is the way to ensure that the rights we enjoy as Europeans and that protect our social model are guaranteed online. So Europe wants to preserve the open and free internet. This is of utmost importance for us, but internet with rules. Allow me to finish here for the moment, because I know the discussion will be ongoing and it's a really inspiring debate. So I'm glad to be here with you and I'm listening to the next speaker. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you, President von der Leyen. Yes, uh, Europe needs to uh, strengthen rules and strengthen rights and invest. Uh, there needs to be a democratization that takes account of the balance uh, between uh, well-developed areas and areas that still need to be developed. Uh, Europe, uh, Africa, Latin America. Let's hear from Professor Prodi on this. Thank you very much for inviting me, thank, and I want to thank Tim Berners-Lee and the President of the Commission warmly for their fascinating interventions. I think they've really given a very exhaustive uh, description of what we need in connectivity. Now, I was asked to, to make a speech, but... Uh, 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 Okay, I preside over a small foundation, and you've mentioned uh, the African uh, Foundation. Well, I see that connectivity, even a minimum connectivity, really helps the economy. Uh, three years ago, uh, we had a meeting of the uh, Pontifical Academy of Sciences, and there were various people who joined in this, and we held a meeting at which we analysed the need for connectivity throughout the world, because we saw it as an equality instrument, of course, in connection with other infrastructure. It's, it's a marvellous instrument, I have to say, because potentially it can penetrate, uh, it is, can be very fast, it, uh, it's, it's a bit like the invention of electricity. Um, so, genuinely, I would say that this must become an instrument uh, a, a justice tool, if I, if I might put it like that, for the whole of the world. We've had a meeting uh, with the United Nations also, or at the United Nations, with the uh, Secretary General of the Telecoms Union, and there were various specialists. And this emerged as a, a genuinely global issue it became clear that there is a political need to bring in parliaments, regions, NGOs, foundations, bring them all in to pull down the various barriers uh, in, uh, which are obstacles at the moment to connectivity so that we have an equality tool of a sort we didn't achieve in the past uh, with other tools. So, uh, we uh, 
uh, well, there was the uh, meeting at the uh, UN, and following this, there was a colloquium with uh, in Geneva, uh, seminar in Geneva. So we continued to work uh, on all of this, and during our discussions, we began to ask ourselves, what institution is doing best in the world? Which institution is uh, heading this fight for equality? And we came up with the answer, it's the European Union. Uh, I genuinely think this is the truth, given the plurality we see in the EU. And, I mean, uh, just look at the latest recovery plan and next generation EU. Connectivity is uh, given a very great prominence there. So there is, I think, political coherence. And I asked President Sassoli, why not uh, set ourselves a mission here? Uh, because th there is so much potential. Uh, why not say to ourselves, let's make this one of our missions because it will lead to good globalization, equal glo globalization, equality. So I think it's a very good thing we are holding this meeting and other meetings of this type. I was very struck by what the previous two speakers said. I thought they put things absolutely correctly and perfectly. Uh, we need uh, to move ahead so that we carry the flag in the EU here. Uh, we must carry forward the, the flag uh, so that we increase e equality. We must avoid discrimination at all costs and ensure e equality. Uh, after all, we are at a pivotal moment in history and I think we do need a, a leap forward, if you like, a, a fast progress. Now, the, the pandemic uh, proves all of this to be the case. Uh, I can only speak, I suppose, for Italy, but uh, people who've not been connected over the past few months ha have been uh, going through awful times. Uh, they can't get education, they can't go to school. So it is an issue of uh, collective justice. Uh, so society has to uh, be fully engaged here. It's, we're not just talking about an economic uh, guaranteeing uh, a good economy, no. And after all, I'm speaking to the European Parliament which is a guarantor of, of freedom of speech and the right to participate in cultural and social life. So, uh, if I might say, uh, we are probably the most representative forum in terms of moving forward this, this right to work, to education, I'm talking to an institution that represents the countries that uh, have invented uh, and, uh, for example, the printing press or, or all sorts of things. Uh, and I'm talking to uh, a forum that is insisting on health and welfare and So uh, I make a strong appeal, uh, let's help the half of the world that doesn't have connectivity, and on the other hand, let us carry the flag. There has to be an institution that uh, carries the flag and, and moves things forward in this regard. So I, I would like to urge the European Parliament to be the spokesperson of this need. I think that's all I'll say. I don't want to repeat uh, what others have said because they put it so well uh, I couldn't possibly emulate, emulate them. So there is a clear 
political battle here that we all need to be engaged in, uh, and it will be to the benefit of the whole world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Brody. So now we're going to hear another recording, another recorded uh, contribution. Can I just uh, say something about the person who has given us this contribution? She's Simona Levy. She uh, works for uh, Digital Rights and the Democratization of the Internet, and she recently founded XNet, which is a European uh, project, and it looks at uh, it is part of the political agenda over the past 10 years, and its main areas of work are uh, digital rights. In 2017, uh, Rolling Stone, the American uh, edition, chose Mrs. Levy as one of the 25 people who are influencing and defining the future of this uh, century. So, can you kindly start the recording of Simona Levy, please? Good afternoon to everybody present. I would like to welcome, uh, with a great deal of satisfaction and hope, the intention to have this forum for debate, and thank you for having an opportunity to contribute to this cause, for which I've been fighting for a long time. And this digital age could constitute a very clear advance in democracy. I think often when we're conceptualizing public policies, we make a mistake. And that is we define digitization in terms of technology. And in a certain way, the technological aspect of digitization is not the most important aspect of it in the same way that technology wasn't the most important part of Gutenberg's printing press, even though it gave rise to the Age of Enlightenment. So uh, technologies like writing or printing have increased the possibility for people to communicate between human beings, that is, and democratizes access to information. And that allows us to exercise our own free will and that allows us to be true citizens are of a, in a responsible way with shared responsibility in society. And this shared responsibility, I believe, is at the heart of the word democracy. In other words, the possibility for citizens to monitor their institutions, to scrutinise them and contribute to them, not just every four or five years, but in an organic fashion. And finally, the digital age will allow this to become reality and will suggest a new form of governance. The mothers and fathers who invented the architecture of the in internet, the network of networks such as Sir, T Sir Tim Berners-Lee, have given us this possibility to uh, deal with this in this way. The internet it was born open and neutral, and that's the way it was wanted. And it if it had only been accessible to some, it would have been a very different of history of humanity we'd be looking at. So we mustn't waste uh, this uh, opportunity we've been given. Uh, for example, the uh, compilation of the genome is a prime example where we have taken advantage of that. So if the invention of printing ushered in the Enlightenment, when reason, science and individual rights were at the heart of human affairs, then digital the digital age constitutes for the first time the next stage in democratization it's a form of co cooperation at the heart of its uh, um, thoughts when we talk about digitization we're looking at the way that uh, you can dissolve the rigidity and central nature of aspects and make them more agile and that means we can be much more uh, free in the way that we approach this. The ideas network of digitalization constitute the only form of democracy possible and is now being transformed into reality all of a sudden because democracy can't just be a single network. Contrary to what some people believe, or want us to believe rather, I believe that democracy doesn't mean everybody thinking the same way, but actually the opposite. It's the possibility to live together i.e. to cooperate together while thinking differently. Digitization then gives us a method to achieve that. It's, it calls on us to update our democracies, to apply the culture of our uh, philosophical architecture to the internet and in other areas. A new democratic culture in a network, that means based on distributed leadership vis-a-vis -vis the competences and necessities that exist. 
which is comprised of sovereign nexuses which are connected between willing actors based on transparency and traceability with a view to pursuing common goals with agility and in real time. As far as I'm concerned, that would appear to be a portrait of a mature democratic Europe that we all want to see, isn't it? However, we must bear in mind that before we were able to really appreciate the creation of Gutenberg and his uh, the, the advantages, Europe had to go through three centuries of obscurantism, during which the old and new political or financial monopolies did everything they could to prevent the population from having access to uh, being able to read whatever they wanted. Three centuries that lasted. So... My wish is that we learn from history so that this does not happen again. Our institutions have a responsibility to make sure that this progress has an impact on the common good and is not denied anybody nor used against the population. And it's for that very reason that I harbour great hopes in seeing you, Madam President, President, Professor, seeing you speak on this issue. Digitisation accelerated by the constraints of the pandemic is unstoppable. Now the question isn't whether it's going to happen or not, it's, the question is whether it's going to be democratic, inclusive of and consistent with fundamental rights or not. So it is incumbent on our institutions that we do not see this happen solely through the desiderata of corporations or interests of electoral cliques. Democracy uh, is also a question of having an asymmetry, uh, the non-symmetry of powers. In order to achieve this, political powers uh, cannot just fluctuate between dehumanised techno-solutionism, thinking that anything can be resolved with an algorithm or technology, or technophobia, which says that all digitization is harmful and should be kept well away from any population. So neither one nor the other. All technology since the wheel, since fire, have had to serve humanity, all of humanity, by highlighting their usefulness, obviously without actually denying the dangers that might be inherent. Now, really, it is extremely urgent. Against the backdrop of the crisis that is just starting, the future of democracy, so that authoritarian or simplistic democracies cannot develop, the future of democracy will depend on being able to move to this age of maturity uh, through uh, digitization and how we achieve that. We cannot ignore the fact that the future we want is to be found in an active and well-informed civil society, which can assume the responsible leadership to promote a number of solutions rather than just being subject to them. There cannot be democracy of the future nor a future for democracy in Europe if only one part of the population can access a network of networks, a network of networks of quality and being a nexus uh, which acts, which fights and cooperates through adversity. And for this reason, the internet should be considered a public service so that it can reach out to every single last corner of Europe. That's not an option, it's an imperative. But more than that, it has to be established that it should serve the common good. As has been said, the European laws are leaders in the world to preserve a structural asset of digitization, i.e. digital net neutrality. There's no discrimination on the basis of economic nor ideological criteria. So now Europe can and must be a leader again in legislation that's drawn up to make sure that particular private interests, economic interests or electoral interests here or elsewhere be allowed to manipulate access to information or feeds off the pillaging of private and intimate data of the population. And in relation to that, I would call on Europe not to give up the defence of freedom of expression. On the contrary, that it shows courage in preventing commercial interests profiting from these values in uh, transforming them into commodities. To conclude, I would suggest we have a democratic Keynesianism. And the first principle of that would be to declare the internet a public service, a right. And I dream that public investment that's necessary to reinvigorate our damaged economies should not just be a technological veneer on obsolete 
governance structures and therefore unfair, but that it actually produces channels for future democracy, i.e. digital sovereignty, for all inhabitants of Europe. A connected future with the right to act, to seek individual and collective happiness in fair conditions. In short, a digital age which constitutes more and better democracy. Thank you. Grazie, Simona Levi. Abbiamo sentito. Thank you, Simona Levy, and uh, what uh, we've heard just now is extremely important. Shared responsibility, democracy, common good, independence of public institutions, uh, and major trust in Europe also. Uh, so this is a, a, a crucial debate that we're holding at the moment. It's not a debate about technologies. It's a debate about the future of our democracies. Can I ask uh, President von der Leyen, if you would care to speak a second time, perhaps now, in the light of what you've heard, please. Yes, thank you so much. So, first of all, allow me to say it's a pleasure to react to the comment of uh, by Simona Levy. And I'm very impressed by her clear views on knowledge sharing, online democracy and disinformation. So, her statement today is a very, very good food for our discussion. Um, Simona Levy touched on a very important point. Our networks are only valuable if they are an open space of freedom, of expression and of innovation. And indeed, Europe is a front runner in protecting an open Internet. So you remember, of course, five years ago, we adopted the first EU wide net neutrality rules. This means no operator can block, slow down, or prioritize certain traffic. And this is an important uh, uh, element for innovation and fair play because it ensures access of all users to all content and services of their choice and vice versa. Our rules ensure access of all content and service providers to all potential users. So these rules are guaranteed by law. They cannot be over uh, said by night, overnight. And they create an enforceable right for all users and content providers in the European Union. We have to ensure that everyone that can connect to the internet and that the internet traffic is neutral. But we also need to match that with our rights and standards that are ensured in the services we use online. So let me say a few words about digital services. During your presidency, uh, Mr. Prodi, the e-commerce directive entered into force and it set important fundamental principles and governs our online space until today. But the world was different. So, for example, many big platforms did not exist 20 years ago. And in the past, we legislated to ensure access by all to the networks. So now we need to do more to ensure fair access to the most vital platforms for business, innovation and free expression. And there need to be clear and actionable rules to prevent unfair dealing in the very, very fast-moving digital realm. Whether it is an app store, a social media or an e-commerce platform. And this is why we now need to upgrade our rules. We have to ensure a safe digital space where rights are protected and business can innovate, grow and compete. So both has to be there. As regards um, the economic dimension, we plan to set out a new framework for how digital markets work, especially when a major platform acts as gatekeeper. These rules will allow faster action against unfair competition but there's also a social dimension to the platform economy. We need to find a balanced approach 
on which one which is effective against illegal goods and content. But at the same time, we have to avoid any incentive for platforms to filter legitimate speech. And this is also what guides us when we look at the Internet as a space for democratic debates. Our challenge, that's the one challenge we share worldwide in the web, is how to respond to disinformation. We're talking about content which may be untrue and harmful and which is not illegal. We need to better protect our democracies against foreign interference through disinformation. And we need to protect our citizens from disinformation. Disinformation can endanger their lives and well-being, such as false health claims, as we see it right now, the COVID-19 infodemic, uh, which spread with the virus, highlighted this once more very clearly. So here, social media giants have a strong responsibility. They are not acting responsibly if their recommendation systems push verifiable false content to the users, or if they profit from it through targeted advertising, for example. They are best placed to map the risks from their services. Let me now turn uh, to one of the most exciting chapters of the digital age, because technology is closely linked to the services uh, we use online. Artificial intelligence has a tremendous potential. Medicine, agriculture, transport, science, you just name it. And the areas where AI will make a huge difference are limitless. At the same time, it raises important ethical questions. A bit earlier this afternoon in my first speaking slot, I mentioned digital sovereignty. That is not only meant economically, as I said. Artificial intelligence is a prime example of digital sovereignty. It is an example of our ambition to apply European standards and values to technology deployed in Europe. And Europe wants to lead the way on AI with the individual at the center. So like that, we also give clear conditions to entrepreneurs so they can innovate. And I must say, for example, as a woman, I don't want algorithms that are only trained on men. The world is wider. And we don't want data to reproduce existing biases, for example, and discrimination on a massive scale. So a lot of things to do. Rights against discrimination, to redress for product safety, are well established in the offline world, but they are not less important online. So whenever AI applications cause high risks to these vital protected human interests, we need the tools to address those risks. And finally, digitization also brings with it challenges, challenges for our social fabric, for people to make most of the new opportunities, we need to invest in education. It came up several times. One in five young Europeans have no basic level of digital skills. One in five. And indeed, during the confinement, new technology was used at unprecedented scale in teaching and learning. But this also highlighted unequal access to connectivity to tools and thus to important opportunities in life. We have to make our education systems fit for the digital age. I think we all agree on how essential the World Wide Web has become for our lives, our societies, and of course our economies, and that we need to drive this expansion of the World Wide Web within Europe and globally. And I believe we all agree that there's a very strong link between access to the internet, technology, 
and fundamental rights. So strengthening citizens' rights is no contradiction to digital leadership. As Europeans, we want to be the global leader of a digital transformation that puts people at its heart. We do not want to be dependent on technology exclusively developed by others. We want to set our own standards where it counts. And this is why we have to ensure and defend our digital sovereignty. Our goal is to ensure that Europe keeps a digital leadership where it has it. And we want to keep control where it matters, most of all where it matters to people. So these were my thoughts and thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Mrs. von der Leyen, for those important remarks. Now, before I give the floor to President Sassoli, can I ask uh, Professor Prodi if he would like to re react at this stage to what you've heard? Professor Prodi, please. Well, I think it really, the second round completed, the f complemented the first one very nicely, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen talked about right to a neutrality, fair access, clear rules, uh, being the, the sort of watch men and women of, of, of these, the guardians, uh, combating the massive disinformation we see regularly, and indeed uh, keeping a close eye on the uh, social media giants. Uh, uh, you, 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 you mentioned also the admission that uh, Europe uh, has here, quite simply because we've done so much in uh, combating discrimination. Uh, so uh, uh, human-centered digitalization is, is vital, and uh, the President of the Commission mentioned this several times. How, of course, do we translate these aims into initiatives, into actions? Uh, well, we can. Firstly, because of uh, scientific uh, knowledge and know-how, and also we're used to coordinating political systems, which are very different uh, one from the other. We're used to this. Uh, I don't think anyone can talk about he 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 hegemony here, uh, and it's a mission, as uh, Mrs. Van der Leyen has said. It's a, a task that uh, has been given to the Parliament and the European Commission for for the future, because no other entity can carry this forward at the moment, neither China nor uh, the United States. Uh, so to, to me, uh, this has come out very clearly from the contributions I've heard today. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen has to leave us now. May we thank you very, very much once again for your contribution. I hope uh, we see you again soon in this, uh, in this debate. Now, uh, President of the Parliament, well, can I first of all thank our participants today? They've uh, set out the challenges before all of us, uh, facing Europe as well, and uh, a few months ago, uh, when uh, this pandemic um, broke out, uh, uh, I, I said we would never be the same again in the future. But, of course, there is a risk here. If we fail to take uh, real steps forward, then some people will be even further behind the rest than they were in the past. So I think uh, reflecting on the uh, major questions and, and being open to new needs and new ideas is vital so that we, we, we follow this uh, determination that no one should be left behind, that no one should, should be excluded. 
uh, and uh, digitalization and internet and the web. I think uh, uh, nicely summarize all the big issues for, for the future. Uh, how are we going to organize ourselves nationally? What are institutions going to look like in the future? What's work going to look like? Study, research. Uh, and, and, and where will our rights be in, in the middle of all of this? Uh, the, the good thing is that there is a challenge facing us, but Europe has been in existence now for, for 70 years. We've built up a whole corpus of, of, of legislation, which I think enables us to uh, tackle uh, new challenges better. Uh, whether you're talking about uh, protecting individual rights, uh, uh, whether you're talking about uh, dealing with the various issues around the Internet or, or uh, defending fundamental values. Uh, and, of course, these have been vital values uh, as we tackle this crisis and as we face into this century. And I think Europe is ready for this. And uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Prodi and the Commission President and, and all those who have spoken today very uh, good speakers, because I think they've shed a light on what is a, a real task, real mission for, for, for Europe. Europe potentially can lead globalization, but a globalization that has rules, rules around defending individual rights. And I think without Europe, we might not have these rules. Uh, wh when a country has just limited democracy, well, then uh, they, they often limit and restrict uh, access to the Internet. Whereas in Europe, we want the web giants to pay tax as well. Uh, we, we would never dream of limiting access to Internet. We would never dream of that. That's the big difference. So I want to thank Professor Brody. I want to thank uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, President von der Leyen, and uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee and uh, Professor Levy for their contributions. But everyone is welcome to join this debate. Uh, indeed, I would urge everyone to feel concerned and involved here, institutions, uh, NGOs, uh, uh, institutions, uh, the world of education, of research and the world of information, indeed, are all involved. And when it comes to the issues that have been discussed today, there is clearly a lot of work to be done. But if our institutions don't see the importance of these issues, then we will all be in trouble. And many people who have suffered over the past few months will be betrayed, and we don't want this to happen. So thank you very much, and thank you. Goodbye, and I look forward to the next uh, conference in this cycle. Thank you.